Welcome to Evangel's guest lecture series. In this session, Dr. Jonathan Quanvig of Baylor University provides an analysis and response to Rob Bell's controversial book, Love Wins. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thanks, it's great to be here, um, right? Pastor's wife once said, once said to me, John, you are the most critical person I've ever met. And I said, no, you don't mean that. You mean I'm the most analytical person you've ever met. And she said, see, I told you. <laughs> well, she was right. She was, she was maybe right the first time, too. Uh, in any case, I'm going to talk about Rob Bell's book. I find this a distressing book in a lot of ways. Have any of you ever seen this man? He's one of the most likable people you will ever see, right? If you're ever tempted to hang out with people at bars, I know, of course, nobody at Evangel would be tempted to do that, but you want to go hang out at a bar with somebody like this. I'm serious, right? When you give a party, you have the people that absolutely have to show up, and then you have the rest of us, right? If they show up, that's fine. Um, he's one of the must-haves, right? He's a fantastic, charismatic, winning personality, and I wish he had more upstairs. <laughs> but if you think about the, the major people in American history that lead the Christian movement, that's the story of Christianity in America too much, isn't it? Right? Um, I recommend the, uh, a part of George Marsden's biography of Jonathan Edwards on this, about the difference between the first Great Awakening, 1737, and the second one, 1803-ish. Right? There's a huge difference between the two. And part of it, uh, a major part of the difference is the anti-intellectualism stuff comes up in the second Great Awakening and had no part in the First Great Awakening. First Great Awakening was in Jonathan Edwards' church. And Jonathan Edwards is the greatest American philosopher. He's not an American, but, right, so anachronism at work. He's the greatest American thinker, at least up until the 1950s. And who knows after that, right? So you get a great philosophical theologian having the First Great Awakening in his church. When's the last time anything like that happened in America? It doesn't happen anymore. So I lament this, but it's important for places like Evangel to do their part by pursuing this virtue of excellence thing that I think we should all be doing. And then this won't be as uh, predominant anymore. Um, the, the pastors and public figures that I find the most attractive in America are all the Rob Bell types. Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, do you all know who this guy is? He's just stunningly interesting um, and um, wacky at the same time, theologically, right? If you read their stuff, you think, wow, do you just get to make it up as you go? <laughs> um, yeah, you do. Maybe that's what purgatory is about. In any case, did you all get, I, okay, I'm, I'm trying to be relevant. Anybody know Hell's Bells? All right, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Right? ACDC, Hell's Bells, don't think about the lyrics. <laughs> don't do that. In any case, it was a play on that for the title, Bell's Hell. What should Christians think? There is a way to make this work. What did I do to make it work? There we go. That's the outline. Um, with any luck, it'll take about 35 minutes to run through. So I want to start with... Um, an approach to the doctrine of hell that I think you're really familiar with. It's what I learned in third grade Sunday school. Um, the strong view of hell, I call it. It is composed of four theses. The first thesis is the punishment thesis. Punishment thesis says the purpose of hell is to punish those whose earthly lives and behavior warrant it. The second thesis is the no escape thesis. It's absolutely impossible to get out of hell once you've been consigned there. Uh, a slight qualification is needed if you're speaking to Catholic groups. Catholics have this doctrine called the harrowing of hell. 
they get it from a passage in, is it First Peter? Some of you that actually know the Bible, remind me if I'm getting it wrong. I think it's First Peter. And one way to interpret the passage is that between Jesus' death and resurrection, he went to hell and let some people out. That's the doctrine of the harrowing of hell. But that's a unique and unrepeatable um, event, if that's the right interpretation. Protestants don't think that's the right interpretation. But if it is, it's not happening anymore, right? So you'd have to alter it. I'm not going to alter the slide. You'd have to say, it's no longer possible for anybody to get out of hell. That one unrepeatable event can't happen anymore. Let's just go with the Protestant version. It's absolutely impossible. Third one is the anti-universalism thesis. There's actually going to be some people in hell, at least Satan. And then you get to pick your favorite people that you want to send there to, to put on the list. I'm not going to put anybody on there right now. I worry that that will generalize to me. Finally, the eternal existence thesis. Hell is a place of conscious existence. All right, now notice I didn't put anything on there about flames and torture and weeping and gnashing of teeth and all that sort of stuff. The strong view is not committed to anything like that. That's an additional element you can put on top of this basic logical structure. I'm not going to say anything about that. If you want to do that, fine, but I'm just going to let that go. Um, I'm going to let it go because there were too many nights I woke up in the middle of a nightmare uh, from stories like that, and maybe you did too. You can make hell very scary to a six-year-old if you want. Anyway, you've got four theses. <coughs> now, there are standard alternatives um, to the strong view that you can find in the history of Christian thought. And they focus around three out of the four theses. There is no standard alternative historically to the punishment thesis. That's a common one. The standard alternatives deny one of the other four theses. So if you deny the no escape thesis, you get a second chance view. Right? So after you die, you get a do-over. Right? If you like golf, it's the mulligan theory of hell. <laughs> um, if you deny the eternal existence thesis, you get annihilationism. Sometimes it's called conditional immortality. On that view, God gives eternal life to the redeemed and nothing to the unredeemed. You just cease to exist completely. That's what hell is on annihilationism or the conditional immortality view. Finally, if you deny the anti-universalism thesis, you get universalism, the view that in the end everybody will be saved. Those are common. All three of those are common, not in the sense of statistically more likely than not, but if you find somebody who denies the strong view, you'll find them embracing one of those other views. The, but the fact that there's no standard historical position that denies the punishment thesis suggests that the core aspect of all those views is the same. What drives the story of hell is that some people deserve punishment. God must punish. And then the other stuff is debatable to the people in question. But historically, people have not debated the punishment thesis. They've only debated whether anybody's going to go to hell, whether there's a chance of getting out once you get there, and whether it involves conscious existence or simple annihilation. So I think of the punishment thesis as the logical core of the view, with the others as not as central. Depending on what you say here, you can get models for the doctrine of hell that map onto explanations of what God's motives are regarding the afterlife. When a doctrine of hell invokes the punishment model, the related divine motivation for presence in hell is pretty clearly justice. But here there's a problem. I'll say initially there's some theological inelegance. Um, 
I'm going to say something stronger in a minute, but let's start there. Why? All right, think about your own motivational structure. Every fully integrated motivational structure involves a hierarchy of dominance that explains which actions will be performed when different motives counsel contrary courses of behavior. So here's an example. Suppose you fear the unknown. And suppose you also are deeply curious. You then have a conflict. Should you come to listen to a talk by a philosopher? Right? Fear of the unknown. What in the world is that going to be? Deeply curious, I want to find out. So which of those two motives is going to win out? The answer is if you have a fully integrated personality, there'll be a structure in place. It'll be hierarchical that will tell you when you have conflicts between two things that motivate you, <coughs> how the conflict is going to get sorted out. So let's say your fear, counsel staying away, your morbid curiosity says to go, which shall you do? If neither motive dominates the other, you're just stuck. You start walking in the door, you walk back out, you walk, right? Uh, you, you end up stultified. If your motivational structure is fully integrated, the hierarchy of dominance answers the question. And since you're here, obviously, curiosity won. Okay? So we want a picture of the divine motivational structure that's fully integrated. An unintegrated structure is a defect. It leaves you double-minded. It leaves you unstable. So, for example, suppose you don't have, suppose it just comes and goes, right? If you had bacon for breakfast, then curiosity dominates. If you had waffles for breakfast, then fear dominates. There's something strange about you, right? You, you, there's a certain way in which the context that you find yourself in is controlling your behavior more than what you want it to. So what we want is a picture of the divine motivational structure that doesn't make God out to be double-minded and unintegrated in that way. The problem is that the strong view has God being exactly like that. Because on the strong view, what explains your presence in heaven is not divine justice, it's divine love. And then when we want to know what explains your presence in hell, we don't appeal to love, we appeal to justice. So we have love and justice, and they compete. We have you standing, God is looking down on fallen humanity and saying, well, I could behave in love toward them, I could behave in terms of justice toward them, which shall I do? And for some, love is the dominant explanation, and for others, justice is. But that's not a, a picture that is yet fully integrated. It just has one motive dominating in one case and the other motive dominating in the other case. What's the fully integrated picture that you can get out of this? Here's how to make progress. To make progress here, just consider the nature of the hierarchy. And here we have the strongest possible clues by looking at the great acts of God. What are the great acts of God? There are two of them, creation and redemption. Creation and redemption are both clearly explained in terms of God's love. God creates because he's a self-giving being. He redeems because he loves that which he has created. It makes no sense at all to try to pull justice out as the explanation. God creates because it's the just thing to do, because the created order deserved to come into existence. That's not a plausible story, right? God doesn't redeem because we're so precious that we deserve to be in heaven. We don't. We don't deserve redemption. Creation doesn't deserve to exist. It exists because God loves, because he's self-giving, and because he cares about us. So pretty clearly, the lesson is this. There is a hierarchy in the structure of God's motivations, and love wins out over justice. Love wins out over justice. 
the theoretical inelegance of the punishment model is that it distorts this picture. It allows the presence, that presence in heaven can be explained in terms of God's primary motive of love, but justice takes the driver's seat when we talk about hell. Now let me caution, when I say love dominates justice, I don't mean God loves us so much that he's willing to behave unjustly. I don't mean that, right? I will, I'm not going to talk about this much, but I'll say, look, read Romans. Romans has this as a fundamental project for St. Paul to solve. St. Paul knows the Old Testament, and he knows there's two kinds of unjust judges, judges in the Old Testament. Those let, that let the innocent be condemned, and those that let the wicked go free. Those are the two dominant kinds of injustices in the Old Testament. And Paul's project in Romans, among other things, is to explain how God is not that. He's not a paradigm case of an unjust judge in the Old Testament, in spite of the fact that we are guilty and we go free. Okay? So the project is to say, how does God manage to preserve his justice while at the same time letting, letting love motivate his behavior so that we don't end up, all of us, in hell. It's a wonderful argument by St. Paul. It's absolutely beautiful, magnificent. He is really smart, whatever you say about inspiration, right? Put inspiration to one side. St. Paul is truly smart. I remember um, when I was a grad student, I went to a talk in Chicago and a, one of the distinguished professors from the University of Chicago got up and said, um, he doesn't have a high view of scripture, so the talk about inspiration, he didn't have to shelve the inspiration stuff. But he said, well, you know, Paul, he's right, he's wrong, all over the map. But I'll tell you this, there's nobody between Aristotle and Augustine that's as smart as St. Paul. And I thought, wow, that's pretty impressive. I think I'll go read the book again, right? So I started, and I think he's right, Paul, Romans is a magnificent accomplishment just from a purely human intellectual standpoint, apart from divine inspiration and all the rest. And however divine inspiration works, he didn't cheat, right? He didn't, he didn't somehow channel God so that it didn't go through his own cognitive processes. All right, so we got a problem. It's not that God's gonna be unjust, it's just that we need a uniform story to explain afterlife, no matter which side you fall on, that preserves the same unified motivational structure in God, and the strong view of hell doesn't do that. This is a pretty ancient problem. I mean, it doesn't go back to the New Testament, I'm not gonna claim that, but most of the stuff you've, you got taught about hell didn't come from the New Testament anyway, it came from Dante. So here's some stuff about Dante. You need some pictures. This is The Gates of Hell by Rodin. Um, notice, oh, I have a little pointer. Can you see that? That's the thinker, which is also a separate independent statue, but it's kind of cool. You can't see the details v very much. Some people think the thinker is supposed to be Dante contemplating his work, uh, but that is apparently controversial. I like it, Con contemplating the poem that he wrote. But um, that doesn't explain why he carved him naked, for example. I mean, and and uh, apparently this guy is pretty muscular and right, Dante might have had a distorted self-image. Maybe he thought of himself as a powerful person, but apparently he wasn't. So there's some controversy about whether that's what that is supposed to be about. But that's the thinker. This is by one of my favorite artists, William Blake. Uh, that's Virgil and Dante standing at the gates of hell, because Virgil's the guide that's taking Dante through all of the gates. And up at the top is an inscription which is frustratingly indecipherable. Can you read it? I can't either. Well, it's interesting because in the poem, Dante describes it as being faded and hard to read. And so Blake is accurate on that. But here's what it says. Through me you pass into the city of woe. Through me you pass into eternal pain. Through me, 
among the people, lost for I. Justice, the founder of my fabric, fabric moved to rear me was the task of divine power, of power divine, excuse me, supremest wisdom and primeval love. Before me, things create were none, save things eternal, and eternal I endure. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Now, you've probably heard the last line at least, right? Dante here reads the inscription and says, these are hard words. These are very hard words. What can they mean? He's troubled by it. So we're talking, what, 1380, early 1300s? It's been around for a long time. And notice the tension in the inscription itself. Here's one line. Justice, the founder of my fabric, moved. So that makes it look like the story about hell is wrapped up with God's justice. But then it also says this. To rear me was the task of power, wisdom, and love. How could love possibly be the motive for hell? What sense can you make out of that? It's actually the view Dante is pointing toward by the end of the poem. It is love that explains it, but how could that be? The first suggests justice is fundamental, the second that love is. But how could love be a motive for building hell. Here we need a different model than the punishment model. This new model is one that's been articulated by various authors, including Dante himself, although poetry isn't philosophy or philosophical theology or anything like that. Richard Swinburne, um, Eleanor Stump, C.S. Lewis, and also me. So how do you get love to be the dominant motive? That is to defend something like the choice model. So here's the particular version I like of defending the choice model. You start with this. Don't think of hell as a place. It might be a place, but don't start thinking that way. Think of it as a contrast with heaven. There are only two options. You're either with God forever or you're not. The not part is what we talk about when we talk about hell. But that's very important because if you don't, if you think of it in other terms like geographical terms, you end up raising all sorts of puzzles that you can't solve. I remember teaching an undergrad course in philosophy of religion at Texas A&M and um, we were talking about heaven and hell and a really bright undergrad says, look, so God wants us to go to heaven but why does he get so upset when I just want to go to North Dakota? And I thought, well, that's even worse than hell. I've been there. <laughs> no, I didn't think that. I didn't think that. But that, that's the idea, right? There's heaven, there's hell, and what if I don't want either one? I just want North Dakota. Right? Now you've got another problem to solve. So don't even get that problem off the ground. Just start with this. Look, there's being with God forever, loving and enjoying him forever, and it's contrast. Not having that. That's where we start with hell. Explain carefully the divine motivational structure, what his reasons, motives are for the great acts of creation and redemption. The answer is love. He's motivated by justice, but that's secondary. Um, now I'm gonna just reject, I'm gonna just reject certain views that are Calvinist, that, that are extremely strong and harsh and, to my mind, morally offensive. There are uh, Calvinists that say God loves the elect and hates the rest. Um, I find that morally offensive. I find it inadequate philosophically, theologically. It's bad in almost every way. I'm not going to argue for it. It's just I'm telling you how I feel. I don't like it. All right? And here's the way I put it. God's love is not strained. Right? It is not strained. It's unlimited. It's maximal and it's universal. He loves all of us. His love is undying even when it's rejected. Presence in hell on this approach arises from our desire, present in the fall, to be like God. Now, fully to be like God is to be absolutely self-sufficient in need of nothing at all outside of yourself. And God is like that. Medievals called it aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. You don't have it. 
you do not have aseity. You can't have it. But that doesn't stop us. We're confused beings. We want to be self-made creatures. We want to be empowered. We want to be responsible for everything that there is about us. It's a kind of mountain man complex. Except mountain men got to rely on nature. We don't even want that. At bottom, we want to be like God. And we do stupid things in pursuit of being like God. Such a desire for full and complete control is a distortion, a perversion of the great gift of autonomy. It is that gift that makes loving relationships possible, relations of accord or union between autonomous wills. That's what autonomy was supposed to be about. It makes love possible. We turned it into something else. In the fall, we distorted it into something about self-sufficiency, self-directedness. It's the supreme expression of God's love to desire and make available such loving relationships between the divine and human. But the distortion, the perversion is always possible. Humans can turn to self over God and do so forever. In the face of such perversion, distortion, twisting of your personality and nature, what is the proper expression of divine love? If you do that, what should God do? The answer is it's hell. That involves honoring the autonomy of the person in question. It involves honoring the autonomous expression of a desire for self to be supreme rather than to find one, one's life in fulfill, fulfillment in relationship to God. So if heaven is loving God and enjoying him forever, hell is where you got what you wanted. You got what you were asking for. The logical end of the desire for independence from God is what hell is. Hell is the logical contrast to being with God, submitting one's will to the divine will, and living in love with God forever. If that's right, Dante's description is fitting. To rear me was the task of power, wisdom, and love, right? Love is clearly the right description of what motivates such a story about Hill. Okay, enough on Hill. That's all background to talk about Rob Bell. What about Bell's book, Love Wins? Sounds like just what I said, right? Love wins. If you go to heaven, love wins. If you go to hell, love wins. Bell says exactly that. What could be bad about that? And now think about it. It's a bit mysterious if that's all that book was about. Remember the people that I listed who defend a choice model of hell? Did you notice anybody really famous on there? Don't say me. C.S. Lewis? Don't say me. C.S. Lewis. How many people have been blasting C.S. Lewis's theory of hell? His take on the doctrine of hell. You've never heard people get, their, get all upset. I almost said something that I shouldn't say. You know what I was thinking, I think. <laughs> Had panties in the word, <laughs> in the phrase. Right? Have you heard anybody get all upset about C.S. Lewis being a heretic about hell? Right? Nobody. Now, C.S. Lewis is not an evangelical, uh, surprising as that sounds. He didn't have the high view of scripture that's characteristic of evangelicals. But that's okay. He didn't, have, he didn't run around saying, uh, there's not very much in the Bible that's actually true. He didn't say things like that. He just, right, he took the Bible seriously, and he took it seriously when it talked about hell and presented a choice model. And he could say, love wins. Either way, love wins. So why? are people all upset about Bill when they weren't upset about these other people? The fundamental starting point for Bill is that God's love is fundamental with the choice model. That's exactly what you get. So it can't be that that's underlying the problem. It's often said that the problem is he sounds like a universalist. He sounds like he thinks everybody's going to go to heaven. But he doesn't actually say that. In fact, it looks like he denies commitment to that completely. He notes, Bell notes, that God wants all to be saved. Anybody think the Bible says anything remotely like that? I think it does. So you can't be upset with him for saying that. 
Um, but he recognizes the possibility of resistance forever. Here's what he says. What we see in Jesus' story about the rich man and Lazarus is an affirmation that there are all kinds of hells because there are all kinds of ways to resist and reject all that is good and true and beautiful and human now in this life. And so we can only assume we can do, so in this, we can do the same in the next. That looks like an explicit admission that there's no guarantee everybody's going to be in heaven. So what Bell does is he expresses hope that universalism is true. But that's not universalism, it's compassion. Right? Hopeful universalism is not a version of universalism. You're just hoping that there won't be any need for anybody to be in hell. It's the same kind of compassion that Dante registered after reading the abandoned hope inscription over hell. He said, Master, these words import hard meaning. He found it troubling what was written over, over it. And we should too. The thought that people go to hell ought to trouble us. It ought to make us unhappy. We should not rejoice. We don't cheer if people end up in hell. Right? That seems about as unchristian as anything could be. Now, I grant that this is extremely hard. Right? I have had a wonderful life. I haven't had great injustices. And I'm not going to go list the great injustices of the world. I think you can imagine what they're like. And you know, you've heard stories of people who have suffered immensely. And I'm not one of those. You probably aren't either. We have soft lives in that sense. If you are a person who suffered immensely at the hands of an identifiable person, it's very, very difficult to say, nonetheless, I hope you're in heaven. It's a very human temptation to say, I hope you rot in hell forever. Right? Um, don't say that. Right? So, it's very easy to have those thoughts, but I think at the same time that you're having them, you can recognize that this is not the voice of the Spirit speaking internally in you. Can't you? Right? That's not what it's about. So it's an extremely hard thing, and I'm certain that if I had a life like that, I would want some people to rot in hell forever. But at the same time, I think, I hope, that I would recognize that as a defect, something that needs to be fixed. And I think we should all be like that. I think we should clearly all be hopeful universalists in that sense. Hope that everybody's in heaven. Okay, so it's not that. What is the real issue with Bill? We still haven't found it. He just defends a choice model, nothing surprising there. He's not a universalist, so you can't get after him for that. Here's what the real issue is. The real issue is what Bell infers from his claims about the love of God. So he starts where I did earlier when I said God's love is not strained. That's what he holds. That God loves absolutely everybody, maximally. He could not love anybody more than he loves you. And the same is true of every person that has ever existed or will exist. It's maximal, okay? So it's off the charts. Everybody get the point that I'm, right? I'm not doing hyperbole here, right? I'm not. I'm just saying this is where it is. It's at the limit. It could not be um, more significant. He starts there. You should expect Calvinists to object, but I don't expect to find a whole lot of sympathy for Calvinism here. So let's move on, okay? <laughs> Um, more generally, the point about the maximal love of God leads Bell to hold that God gives every person the opportunity to be saved, either in this life or the next, because of the scandal of particularity. Now, I'm going to talk about the scandal. This is a Kierkegaard phrase. doesn't matter where it came from, but here's what the issue is. Remember I told you that story about you're given a party? So God's given a party. This is a... a uh, I'm not trying to trivialize heaven. But right, it's going to be a party, in some sense. And so he's got an invitation list, right? And I told you what my invitation lists are like. There are the must-haves, 
And then there's the other people, right? That, God's not like that. Everybody's a must-have on God's list. Otherwise, he doesn't love everybody maximally. You see that? It's essential to Bell's concern that we have that maximal conception of God's love. There's no must-haves and it's okay if they show up too. Right? It's the same attitude toward everybody. So, what happens is you should expect God to try as hard as he can to get you there. Right? No matter who you are, he should try as hard as he can to get you there. No guarantees of success, but he's going to try as hard as he can. So he's not going to take Northern European people and work really hard on them, but not so much for the Africans. Right? You should not expect that sort of thing in your theology. Okay, got it. So what's the scandal of particularity? that is motivating Bill. Three aspects here. First, the first concerns adequate soteriology. What must a person know or believe in order to be saved? What must you know or believe? To? I'm not asking you to answer it. I'm just asking you to think about it. What do you have to know? The second concerns the notion of a maximally effective divine encounter. So if God's going to try as hard as he can to get you to heaven, He's going to get you in a position where all the information that you absolutely have to have to be saved is available to you. So, for example, if you have to know something about history, if you have to know that there was a first century Jewish man who lived and died, was crucified and raised from the dead, if God's going to give you a maximally effective divine encounter to get you to the party, you have to be in a position where that information is available to you. Okay, the third concern is when and if the door of opportunity for salvation is closed, and the traditional answer to that is <coughs> death. When you die, end of story. Those are the three aspects of the scandal of particularity. Standard responses on these issues force a limitation on God's love. Here's why. The traditional view is that the door of opportunity is closed at death, and that a person must now know or believe something specific about Jesus of Naz Nazareth in order to be saved. But look, it's obvious that not everyone has heard about Jesus before they died. That's obvious. So what follows from the usual views is that God's love is strained. Not all will receive a maximally effective divine encounter. Okay? That's what's bothering Bell. So Bell resists. He insists, whatever we give up, we're not giving up that God's love is maximal. He insists that God's love is not strained and that the proper conclusion to draw is that the door of opportunity for salvation is not closed at death. So notice there were three things going on there. He held on to two and gave up a third one. Right? He held on to the maximal love of God he held on to the stuff that you have to know about Jesus to be saved, and he gave up that the door of opportunity was closed at death. Now that's a problem. That's a problem because, look, th there are some very general things you can say about the Bible. And here's one of them. History has a directionality to it. There is a goal or an end or a telos that all of the created order is headed toward. It is the consummation of all things in Christ. There is a finality at some point to the story of what God has created. You can put that in terms of the final judgment scene or something like that, but there has to be finality in the story. At some point, it's over and done, right? The final judgment has been pronounced we're done. Now, if you tell a story and you say, oh, but there's always a chance, right? You just lost finality. There is no culmination. There is no end. There's no telos. And there's nothing any more fundamental in Scripture than that point. Okay. It's this loss of finality in the story that I think at bottom bothers people. 
and legitimately so. Now, I think they'll put it in the form of, what do you mean the point isn't finished, the story isn't finished at death? Of course it's finished at death. That's what the Bible says. Well, that's worth checking to make sure that's what the Bible says. But even if the Bible doesn't say exactly that, it doesn't matter. The Bible clearly teaches that there is a point of finality. There's an over and done with thing at some point. So you can't just leave it open-ended forever and ever and ever. That's not the biblical story. Here's the incoherent triad then that Baal is responding to. The first claim is God's love is not strained. Second, finality must be preserved. So, I suggest what we really need to do is think more seriously about soteriology. What does it take to be saved? What's absolutely essential to salvation? From a cognitive point of view, I mean, if you ask me what's essential to salvation, I'll talk about the will. You need to submit your will to the will of God and turn yourself in repentance to following his desires and loving him forever to the best of your ability. All right? That's all about the will, right? That's the affective side. Now, what's the cognitive dimension here? Because it was the cognitive dimension that was driving some of this problem. The cognitive dimension, you have to know about a first century Jewish man. You have to know that he lived, that he died, that he was resurrected. Okay, that's the cognitive stuff. But that's what I think we need to pay more attention to, especially in this regard. We need an account of the cognitive dimension of salvation that's uniform so that it explains both why St. Paul is in heaven as well as why Abraham is in heaven. I want the same story. So you can tell there's certain forms of dispensationalism that I don't like. It may be all of them. But in any case, I don't like the ones that say, well, Abraham was saved under one particular scenario and set of requirements, and Paul and the rest of us under another one. It changed. I don't like that. I want a uniform account, and I actually have a biblical argument for it. Paul is clear in Romans that that's what God was doing through all of history, right? He makes it clear. Abraham's saved by faith. We're saved by faith. Everybody's saved by faith. What does that involve? That's what I think we need to think more clearly about. That's it. Thank you.